right, welcome back everybody to the Quiet Light Podcast. I'm really excited to have Roger Hardy on the podcast today from kits.com. Roger uh, has been in the online world for a really, really long time. Um, And that's not to say that you're old, Roger. That's just, uh, I've been in this for a long time. It's nice to talk to somebody who understands what Yahoo Shopping Cart actually is and uh, has probably used it before. Um, At one point, Roger had the largest exit uh, for an online business in Canada, which is really, really cool. We're gonna talk about his story about growing uh, that business, what it was like to grow something to that size and have that exit. Before we start, just as a reminder, this episode is brought to you by Exitpreneur. If you have not downloaded your copy of Exitpreneur or bought your copy, yet, please do so. You can find it on amazon.com. This is the complete guide to how to prepare uh, an online business for sale. Everything that we teach and everything that we look at when we're looking at a business that uh, we might help sell, this is the absolute guidebook for it. So go to amazon.com, download it. It's a bestseller. It's got tons of really good rating, five-star ratings at this point. We're hearing from people left and right about how much they wish they had this book before they sold the business or how much this uh, book is providing them with a roadmap to maximize the value. So go to amazon.com, download it, uh, send a message to me, not to Joe. I don't want his ego to get any bigger uh, about uh, how great the book is. Just send a message to me about uh, what the book has done for you. Really appreciate it. Roger, super happy to have you on today. Thanks, Mark. Great to be here with you. Very exciting. I want to start off the same way that our initial call went, um, and that's nothing to do with the online world, and that's your involvement in NASCAR. That's pretty cool. What, what do you have? Uh, you have some interest in NASCAR, right? Well, you, you know, we, uh, we, we've, we did participate in the Indy 500, which took place uh, back on uh, July 4th uh, down in Indianapolis, and uh, we ran a car there. Uh, with a Canadian team, actually, it was the only Canadian running in, in the Indy 500, uh, Dalton Kellett uh, in the kids.com car. So super exciting. Uh, Dalton and his family, just just a great family that's uh, been running the K-Line car for a while in Indy. And uh, for anyone who loves racing, I mean, you can't get any better than, you know, we were in the pits at Indy watching the team tr- change tires and watching the cars come in, having our brand on the side of the car. Very exciting for all the Kits uh, team, all the, our Kits family, and uh, super exciting to work with them. So uh, great exposure. You know, it's, I think, the biggest uh, fan engagement so far this year up to that point in the U.S. So, I think, you know, there are 90,000 to 100,000 people come through the gates. Uh, super, just, just, I mean, you can't have any more fun than that in a weekend, I don't think. Uh, what a great event. Yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that's a... Uh... It's a cool conversation starter, even cooler to be down in the pits and everything. I am not a, a, a racing fan, but it's one of those events where I don't know anything about it. I would love to go to, to uh, an event like that. I've always heard once you go, it's like an, ex- an experience like no other. It, it really is. Yeah. And I, and I guess I'm like you. I only got into it uh, running a car a couple of different times and it's just a thrill. I mean, I think we pin- finished in the middle of the pack and, you know, we may as well have won from our perspective. It was just so so enjoyable to uh, to participate on that level. Yeah, I'd, I'd encourage anyone who can get get into the pits to do it. It's uh, you know it's the, the most exciting eight seconds when a car comes in. You know the gas goes in, the wheels come off, and out it goes in under eight seconds. I mean it's fantastic. That's pretty cool. Oh, we didn't uh, we didn't uh, jump on this to talk about racing as much uh, fun as it is uh, to, to be able to talk about that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your exit and uh, building a business uh, up in Canada. What was the business first of all? Yeah, sure. So uh, back in 2000, a bit like you, um, in the early days, the the internet web, uh, my sister and I started a company. It was called Coastal.com. Uh, it was a vision care provider similar to Kits. Uh, we sold contact lenses initially, then launched an eyeglasses business, became the largest seller of eyeglasses online, uh, Coastal.com, when we uh, got an unsolicited bid in, in 2014. And, and I should just back up and say that company grew from startup in 2000 to be um, you know, uh, uh, the largest seller of glass and contacts online. We listed it on the NASDAQ in 2012. So it was a fairly big and interesting business, did business all around the world, uh, office in, in Scandinavia that, that handled Europe, uh, an office in Australia, New Zealand that did Asia Pack, and then uh, one in Vancouver and one in uh, Washington State that handled uh, North America. So grew very quickly, became NASDAQ listed, and then um, Essilor, um, who is sort of the the gorilla of the category, the 25 billion euro monolith of, uh, of glasses in the world uh, came along and, and uh, made an unsolicited bid for the, the company in 2014. Uh, so we took the, the offer to our shareholders and, uh, you know, frankly, they were tickled pink. Uh, it's about a half a billion dollar offer and so uh, all cash offer. So 
uh, from the startup uh, that my sister and I built a website, you know, bought our first inventory on our credit cards, you know, the, that type of story to half a billion dollar exit, the largest exit in, in Canadian e-commerce history at the time, still, I think, is either the biggest or one of the biggest. So, um, yeah, it was a good it was a good run. How long, how long of a period was that? 2000s a starting point? When was the exit? Yeah, started 2000, sold in 2014. Um, and as I said, the NASDAQ listing in 2012. So, you know, gosh, we wish we had your book before uh, we'd done that sale. Uh, I'm sure we would have learned a lot from it. And, uh, you know, as you know, the experience of doing exits, uh, you know, you learn something on every single one. And so the more you're involved from, in, the more you can learn from others. Uh, it's, uh, it's helpful, right? Like anything. Yeah, no, that, that, I mean, that, I'm sure people hearing the number, right? Half a billion dollars uh, cash is going to make some eyes bug out, uh, you know, because a lot of the, the conversations we have with people are on much different scale, right? Much, much smaller scale uh, than that. What I love about this, though, is the startup part, right? You and your sister buying inventory on credit cards um, back in 2000. What, what shopping cart did you start out with? Yeah, funny you, you mentioned the Yahoo Shopping. You know, we we had a home built, a homegrown system here. Uh, my sister's uh, husband, uh, boyfriend at the time, was a computer science engineer, and we basically pulled together all the friends and family we had, and and uh, you know built a, a homegrown system that that we started out on, and and it it continued to evolve to be pretty much homegrown. Uh, you know, all the way through to sale, it was a proprietary system right to 2014. So. Um, you know, but we, we were there at the beginning of things like go to and overture, which I think you and I are the only two guys to remember, uh, and, you know, which became Yahoo and, uh, and then ultimately became kind of what, you know, what Google is now, which is sort of a pay per click model. So, uh, and it evolved very quickly, as you'll recall, then, you know, we're one of the first to buy advertising to Alta Vista, uh, Lycos, all those snap.com before it was something different, you know, there was a snap.com. So, all of these, hopefully, you know, you, you know, people could remember uh, if they were if they were alive back then. It was, yeah, it was an interesting times. It all evolved so so quickly. Yeah, I, you know, I know that there are people listening that actually do. You know, they've been around that long. And they're hearing those names and uh, bring them back. You know, the Snap.com, the GoTo.coms. I remember playing around with those engines and uh, seeing what they were doing and, and what a different world was uh, back then. Um, how many employees did you have? Throughout at the time of the exit, how many employees did you have? Uh, at the time of the exit, about 750. Um, and at the time of the start, it was my sister and I literally in a, you know, in a, in a basement and then a basement suite. And then, uh, then we actually got an office. And, and, and uh, like I said, her boyfriend, now husband, uh, joined us and, uh, and grew from there. You know, growing a business like that from startup where it's two of you to 750 employees, that's got a series of climbs and plateaus and climbs and plateaus that every time you reach those plateaus, you as the, the founder need to figure out how do I navigate and get to that next growth cycle. And from the, the speed with which you went from zero to half a billion, you obviously navigated those plateaus pretty, pretty quickly, right? Um, what point, which one of those would you say was the most difficult? What size would you say was the most difficult to navigate? And I think, I mean, in fairness, there's probably way different qualities. I know 20 employees and 40 employees can be choke points for some companies, 100 can be choke points. But dealing with the 20 employees and the choke point there is way different than dealing with, say, a 300 employee choke point. Does anything stand out in your mind as far as, boy, this was a really difficult challenge or even that decision point of, yeah, let's, let's keep pushing growth? Or is that always front of mind? Yeah, well, okay, a couple of questions in there. But, um, you know, for sure, we were always growth minded, just the way the company started. <clears throat> we had that growth mindset, it was built into the culture, built into the core values, built into everything we did. Um, I would say, you know, and that that focus on growth kept us always searching for the next growth vector. So we're always looking at the category, what's the growth vector? How can we innovate? How can we be out in front of this? And I think in every category, there are growth vectors, even, you know, the contact lens business was only growing, you know, eight or 9% single digit, but our company was growing, grew 30% a year for 14 years. So we were always able to kind of find that fast growing vector inside the category and then, you know, launch the eyeglasses category, which became, you know, a, a very fast growing and, and very interesting part of the, the business, which ultimately led to why Essilor acquired the company. So, um, 
the biggest choke point I would say was less about people for us because I think we had culture baked in early. And so people scaled in a predictable way. I would say it's just, you know, finding those growth vectors, trying to innovate, and especially when you get to hundred million, you know, you're on everybody's radar at that point. Everybody, you, you've got a bunch of competitors. They're all fighting for different sectors and, and you have to kind of understand your segments, understand who you're trying to reach and understand really what's your differentiation? What are you gonna do that's different and better for customers? And that's what kept us growing all the way along. Yeah, you, you said the culture was baked in. Uh, how important do you think the culture was to to uh, the growth that you experienced and being able to maybe navigate some of those those changes um, to, uh, throughout the entire history? Yeah, I think I think you're so right to uh, to talk about culture. I think it was key for us to grow, um, you know, from a people standpoint to have cultural values baked in early and then to reinforce them in everything we did every morning huddle every weekly team meeting uh, every quarterly launch where we identified the priorities for the quarter make sure that everybody knew their contribution for the quarter to those priorities literally sitting on their desk and you know to be direct i think with COVID, i think it's gotten harder when people are working remotely i think uh, especially in fast growing companies you know your culture is being defined over zoom and and you've got people you know, that you you may not have met even in six, 12 months in a fast growing company, uh, it's it's tougher to get the culture, I think, as connected. Um, you know, kids.com, we've hired more than 100 people in the last year. Uh, and we did a team event, you know, kind of at the end of Q1 when COVID sort of let up. And I was shocked. We had two guys who were six foot seven. And on Zoom, maybe, you know, they don't like you know, they don't come across as <laughs> six foot seven. You go, you know, where, where did this happen? And then, and, and as some of the other team, it's same thing, you know, just like, wow, you know, you're so cool to meet you and your energy in person is obviously different and you can connect better, I think in person. So, you know, it's, uh, I think that was key for our, our, our past company culture. And what we're trying to get at kits is just a high level of connection with our team, high level engagement. And what, what's the mission here? What are we trying to do? And, um, you know, let's have some fun doing it. Did you set that out from the beginning as far as identifying what are our core values going to be? What's our mission? Yeah, you know, what's our purpose and and uh, why we're we're doing these these things? Were these well defined from day one? Yeah, they you know they really were for us. Um, I think I read a book really early on, uh, you know, like in two two thousand right away that that spoke to culture and it was and it and it had a, a bunch of kind of character traits and so we set that out. But that then continued to evolve. So, you know, I don't, I don't think it's up to the CEO to set and define culture. I think I did the initial one. I set the initial mission. And then it's about getting everybody else around the table each quarter to say, hey, is this, is this still the mission? Are these still the values? And so those values over time would evolve and, and they would, I think they got better and better uh, over time. You know, we, we didn't, you know, over time we added one that was about doing good and doing good for our company, having a, a purpose that that was more than just, you know, contributing you know to vision the vision category so we we provided more than a million pairs of eyeglasses to people in need around the world you know in in places where a pair of eyeglasses was tough to get and flying our folks all over the world to put glasses on you know the elderly and others and seeing the you know the reaction they would have for the first time seeing their grandkids was you know it was pretty um it was pretty moving and it was pretty foundational to to our culture to build that in to say hey you know, we're going to have a purpose here that does good in the world. Uh, and yeah, that, I think, think those kinds of things, you know, it, that evolves. That was beyond just me saying that back in 2000. That really kind of evolved into that. And that's what we try to do at kids.com as well as we, we set a, a vision, but especially a company growing as fast as ours, you know, over 100 million of revenue in under three years. It's grown very quickly. So the culture almost has to evolve as you go through each stage of growth. Like you said, 10 million looks like one thing. I think 25 to 50 is another. And as we get to 100 million where we are now, you know, the culture has to evolve really, really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you follow things like EOS? Uh, are you familiar with that? Are you familiar with uh, some of these tractions or, or you know, uh, different systems that people are trying to implement into, your, into their businesses? Do you follow that at all? No, I'm not. I don't know EOS. I'll have to hear about it. Okay. Uh, just, just wondering like what your, it sounds like you follow some systems within your businesses as far as frequency of meetings, making sure that you uh, are looking at initiatives. How did you come up with, with the structures and the systems the that you would use within your business? Yeah. So our, our cadence was really set uh, again, early on. I just happened to go to a lunch and a guy called Vern Harnish, who many entrepreneurs probably know from scale up uh, hosting a lunch in Vancouver. 
and you know a bunch of you know random you know small business guys like me at the time we were three four months into our company it had gone sixty thousand the first month one hundred twenty I think our run rate was two hundred fifty thousand in our fourth month and um, he did the lunch it was a one hour presentation <clears throat> everybody got up and left I just sat there I just I just sat there everybody left I said excuse me you know Mr Harnish sir uh, everything you just said I need desperately. You know, I, my, my teachers were both, or my parents were both teachers, didn't have any, you know, <clears throat> business, business, real uh, experience. My sister had a degree in, in engineering and, uh, you know, so, so, you know, everything that he said. So that, that was really the base of all those systems. And we've kept running those scale up systems. He called them the Rockefeller habits then, but now scale up systems ever since. And um, those have evolved as well, but uh, yeah, that's been what we've used. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fascinating. Um, thank you for that, by the way, that, that, that I think that's really important, especially in an acquisition, right? When you're buying a business for a lot, a lot of our listeners, they're going to be buying businesses and how do you bake culture in, or how do you inherit that culture as well? You know, how do you make that sort of transition? Um, because I do think culture and, or you, as you, you put it cadence, right? Within the company, having that in place is really, really important. And I think it's a consideration for anyone, uh, buying a business. Um, I'd love to know from you, uh, did you ever utilize debt? To grow the business and and uh if you did what went into that decision? obviously you use credit cards but I'm, i mean you even more formal uh sort of uh, uh debt uh processes yeah you know you know so the business um we we tended not to use it early on and then we we basically had a line of credit as we went um and got and that just continued to expand uh i should say we we did do a um a sub debt round just before the ipo and the idea there was to put some, um, to grow the business without giving up equity for the last kind of, you know, the last year. And so we raised about a half a million in, in with sub debt terms. Sounds crazy today, but I, I think the, the the rate was about 15%, right? So, oh, <laughs> um, you know, but in that year, I think our business grew 40%. So it was one of those trade-offs where we grew the business faster, the equity would have been dilutive. Um, and in the end, it, it ended up being productive. But I think today with, with uh, with you know the cost of capital being lower, uh, it's probably productive for people to consider. I think you know going back to debt though, debt is a high risk uh, undertaking for small, you know, early stage ventures sub sub ten million. I think it can be you know if you if you ever borrow money, you have to make sure you can pay it back. I mean, I guess that's a simple truth, but I sure hear a lot of stories and and have unfortunately seen the the, the realities of. You know some of these loan sharks out there that'll loan you money, and they're they're really just trying to take your business. So I think it's something to be to be super prudent and careful with. Yeah, I just uh, the, the growth that you had. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to unravel some of the things that happened behind that growth and, and the growth mindset that you obviously had as a culture mindset within your company, and the different tools and levers that you pulled to be able to get there. Because I know a lot of our our audience maybe they've experienced their first exit and maybe they they sold for the half a million dollars or a million dollars or two million dollars and now they have their sights set on bigger things they want that hundred million dollar exit that 250 million dollar exit and that's that's where they're at so how do they get there you know what what tools do they they, they use you know, utilize to get there and i think so far you know what i'm hearing is obviously you got to set the culture right i'd love to know from you you've taught it for 14 years within your company do you remember the core values of the company yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I can tell you the core values and then maybe talk a bit, bit more about the growth between those different segments. But um, uh, it, so it was, it for, it was team uh, bias to action. So, you know, we, we, we're going to reward people for taking action, whether it's right or wrong, do it, learn something, move on. Uh, agents of change. So knowing that, you know, we're trying to change a category, there's going to be friction in that. Um, uh, do more with less uh, was one of them, you know, uh, I guess it's obvious again, but, um, you know, we, in, in its sense of interviewing and adding team members, you know, we, we weren't looking for people coming out of big companies that had a big company mindset. I'm going to come in and hire 15 people and I'm going to need, uh, you know, three admins and that sort of thing. We, we always wanted to say uh, entrepreneurial, um, you know, uh, do, doing, uh, doing good, you know, so um, being focused on making a contribution, giving back, having a purpose. And um, so, I mean, a lot of these we've tried to incorporate in the early days of kits and the, the, you know, they're, they're kind of set a little differently, but, um, but, but uh, all those, um, you know, and I don't have them written in front of me, but uh, how many am I? I'm at five or six. 
Yeah, it's not bad for, yeah, seven, no, it's for seven years out. They're still kind of, you know, they were on the back of my uh, my my card, my key card for so long. Uh, and and every quarter we did reinforce them. So that's actually you seeing two more or less uh, team. Uh, Anyway, there'll be one more that'll come back in a second. But um, on your one one your point about, you know, how do you get from a $50 million access to a $100 million access? I mean, for us, it was finding the growth vector in every category because every category has some part of it that's growing quickly. Uh, and then looking for the products that are, you know, that are kind of uh, that, you're, that customers need. So for us, it was listening to customers. We were a contact lens business until 2008. Um, we were listening to what customers told us and, and eventually we heard enough. I love what you did for me in contact lenses. You made it more cost effective. You saved me some time. You saved me some money. But every time I walk into the, the eye doctor, I'm walking out with, you know, $700, $500 pair of plastic and glass. How is this possible? And when we heard it enough, you know, at first we were like, wow, you know, glasses, it sounds complicated. You know, these two companies control the whole world. We can't really help with that. But we heard that message enough. We started looking into it, trying to figure out, you know, how, do, how could we participate in the category? Could we actually do something good and valuable for customers? And it was literally hearing that message over and over again that, um, you know, we decided to launch the eyeglasses business and, and then got, you know, super focused on how to deliver a tier one product, so sourcing the planet for the best quality eye care providers. And, and, and you know, ultimately that led to us vertically integrating, right? So, you know, I think, um, that was kind of key. So taking the, you know, taking our one product, hearing what our customers are saying and, and adding in that second product um, and vertically integrating it. You know, the second most creative thing businesses can have done in the last 20 years, if you're B2C or, you know, like a direct to consumer, like many of the companies that I think you, you help um, has been to vertically integrate, you know, find a way to have your own brand in the category, um, do something special, differentiated, you know, on your own. Uh, and, and I think that that was a key step in, in really contributing, you know, taking the value of the company that that alone doubled the value of the company. Yeah, you, you said something in there and it was almost a throw throwaway uh, sentiment uh, to it. But I think it's so important. Uh, you know, what prevents a company from from growing and, and seeing that massive acceleration? And I think it's taking on the difficult challenge, right? It's it's seeing something that is difficult, seeing something that might be complex on its surface. And deciding, you know, we're actually going to try and unravel this, and we're going to try and see if we can solve it. You, you listen to the marketplace, hear what the marketplace is saying, and then try and address that. You know, that, that solves the product market fit. But a lot of people don't move into the challenge. But what, what I think, because of the work involved, right, and because of the risk, or at least the apparent risk, but the benefit of it is, is that challenge is also a moat. It's also protection. It also gives you, uh, if you figure it out, space to play without any competitors with a market that's ready and willing. Um, and boy, you know, just hats off to you for pursuing the challenge, listening to people and pursuing the challenge and obviously it paid, it paid off dividends. Um, with, it can be with kits.com. Uh, I imagine you, you pulled a lot of the same lessons uh, between the two companies here. Uh, what, what are your quarterly meetings look like? It sounds like you have quarterly meetings as part of a regular cadence for what you're doing. Uh, if you don't mind me asking. <clears throat> Yeah, sure. So, so the company, uh, as I said, in the third year, we just did an IPO on the Canadian exchange on the TSX, uh, raised 55 million to invest in growing the business, getting the brand out there. Uh, and so we do uh, quarterly meetings where we identify priorities in each functional area. So the marketing team, uh, they'll each have, they'll have a top five that rolls down into the entire team. So if I'm in charge of, let's say paid media, I've got a top five things I got to do. If I'm in charge of email retention, customer journeys, I've got a top five and so on. And then that, that rolls through to customer service. If I'm answering calls, I've got a top five around satisfaction, around how many calls I do around, you know, uh, you know all, all kinds of different metrics so that blend in there. And so we try to put, you know, those metrics in front of people that we think all tie into the top five of the company. So, which is, you know, generally starts with revenue, goes into to margins, earnings, and then and then into satisfaction metrics. Um, you know, for us, we're focused on NPS, Net Promoter Score. We think that the the best Net Promoter Score in every category, that company ultimately has the highest value in the category. And so, we're very focused on listening to customers. We have the the most uh, satisfied customers and the highest review count in the category today. And so, that gets us really excited. We see that our competitors turn off their customer comments. 
And I think, you know, there are folks that do that, right? And these are big companies, billion dollar businesses we compete with. They turn off their customer comments. If you think about that, you know, that to me, yes, you're going to have some customers that are unhappy and they're going to say some awful things to you online. We all know everybody has a voice, but you know, you got to be willing to listen to that, take a bit of flack and, and try to get better every day. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, and so we're super excited to have the satisfaction metrics we do, the best in the category. That ultimately is what we think leads to growth. If you have happy customers telling the story to other people they know, friends and family, I mean, that's how we found out about Google, right? Somebody told you, hey, have you tried Google? Somebody, that's how you found out about Facebook. Someone said, are you on Facebook yet? You know, have you tried Instagram? You know, none of these things, you didn't see an ad for any of those products, right? And, and yet that, that there was somebody told you about it. So to the extent we can, that's what we're trying to do is, is provide you a pair of glasses that wows you so much that you want to tell your friends and family about it. We want, you know, uh, a pair of glasses at kits.com, $69. We, we think it's the highest quality frame you can get in the market. And, we, and we're sure that, it, you know, other companies are paying more than that to acquire a customer. So we want, you know, if we can wow a customer and they tell the story, that, that's really, you know, for us, that's, that's kind of what we're trying to, that's the nirvana, you know, that's the lift moment for our company, right? It's when word of mouth carries it. And you, you, you can't get there unless you're leaning into the negative comments though, right? I mean, you so need right. to lean into that. You're so right. You know, I, I think, uh, and that's why I think some of these companies have such a high acquisition cost that they, they ignore the market. Um, you know, we, when we launched our glasses offering a kit, biggest thing we heard over and over again, uh, and the biggest comment was where are progressives, you know, uh, which is, you know, if, if people are under 45, they don't know what a progressive is, but basically a bifocal. Once you're 45, it gets harder and harder to see the menu and see, you know, see small print. Uh, we've all seen our friends kind of, your arms get too short and squinting. So those are progressives. And we kept hearing that comment over and over. We said, this is a very complex thing to make a progressive lens, to make a bifocal lens. We need very sophisticated equipment. It's millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars we had to put into that to be able to make that. And like you said, you know, what's the thing that's hard to do that's really good for your customer? If you can find that hard thing to do that's good for your customer, that's where, that's, you know, that's a sweet spot, right? If it's easy, everybody's doing it. It's the hard thing that, is creating value for your customers. So we we do a digital progressive lens that retails across the states anywhere from six hundred to eight hundred dollars. We retail that for one ninety nine now, and that's you know we've got the best state of the art equipment. We're running in a completely automated lab. It's made in North America. Um, you if it orders today, it's on your doorstep tomorrow morning. So, you know those are some of the things we're trying to do is is take that hard thing and make it easy and and give customers a wow. Yeah, between company culture, having a good cadence to your company. Uh, utilizing uh, growth in the right way, you know, different growth levers, and uh, and then obviously listening to the customers, pursuing the hard things. Uh, you, you've done you've done some amazing things. Half a billion dollars uh, in uh, for, for the offer. Obviously, you didn't get all a half billion dollars. You were a public company, but how did you celebrate? That's a that's a really big feather in the cap. Yeah, I mean, great question. We we were, you know, it was a real team effort. And um, that probably the best part was knowing that along the way, we'd had an employee share ownership plan. So all of our staff and employees, I think it was 92%. So anyone had been there more than three months, we would match their contribution. So all the staff had been, you know, accumulating stock and and really the run up uh, in, a lot, in a year before we sold the stock, you know, more than, I think it either doubled or doubled in a, you know, a bit more than doubled. So it was just, you know, holding that, that big party, that event, um, you know, I took all the 20 managers out. I bought them all sort of a, a deal gift and uh, looked like a Super Bowl ring. <laughs> you can believe it. Bought them all a Super Bowl ring because that, that was as close as we were going to get to the Super Bowl uh, <laughs> ring. So, uh, but, you know, that, that just celebrating with the team was really the, the most rewarding part. Um, you know, it was uh, financially, you know, obviously great for, for all, all the team. And that, that's the biggest reward. And we're trying to do the same thing at Kits again. That's the nice thing about being public is, uh, is getting everybody on board, getting everybody, you know, as owners and thinking like owners. That's really the target for me is if I, it's no good for me to think like an owner and everybody else think like an employee. I need, you know, in that case, all 750 people. In this case, you know, the 150 that we're We'll be at shortly here, all kind of thinking like an owner, pulling in the same direction. So I know not everybody thinks that way with equity, but it's been my experience that I would rather have everybody owning some stock and kind of, and then and then I can you know hold them accountable and say, hey, I need you to think like an owner, and and I need us all on the same page here, and and you know challenging them. Is that how an owner would think? Would you make that decision if it was your money? 
You know, would you pull that same trigger? Would you do that same thing if it was your money? And uh, that's that's kind of something that, um, you know, I, 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 anyway, so all that to say, yeah, it was a good celebration. You know, team win uh, felt really good. We're just up about time. It goes fast, these conversations, because I, I can always like, <laughs> yeah. pick your brain for more. And I mean, I, I'm not sure if you understand just even some of the, the uh, subtle comments you're saying, I think are dripping with some business wisdom. Obviously, what you've been doing is, has been remarkable. Kiss.com, you're at 100 million in sales, three years old, you said, is that right? Yeah, yeah, this is about third year, correct. My goodness, and you on public, uh, when, when did you go public with it? In January. Congratulations, that's awesome. Yeah, thank you, yeah. That, that, that's incredible, and what, uh, what, what's the horizon on that? Just continue to grow that and uh, replicate the success? Yeah. Yeah, so we were public in the Canadian market, TSX. Um, I think as we get a little bigger, we'll probably do a NASDAQ listing, you know, next year. Um, and we'll wait and see if others in the U.S. kind of, uh, you know, bring some attention to the category. There's a few other folks that are, um, you know, maybe thinking about doing uh, doing IPOs and listings. And I think that just brings some eyes and attention to the category. And people get the sense that, hey, I can actually buy eyeglasses online. It's really easy. It's easier than buying almost anything else because, you know, remarkably, the, the size of your glasses is right inside the arm. Just people don't know that. And you get a copy of your prescription. It's easy to enter. And, uh, you know, gosh, saves you 50 to 70 percent. So that that's kind of uh, what keeps us growing, gets us excited. And uh, it's a real pleasure to talk to you, Mark. You know, I, I love all your insights. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's impressive how you're able to help companies and really and break it down. I, I think you articulate my story better than I do. So nice to chat with you. Well, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with me. It, this, uh, these are always a good opportunity for me to pick uh, really smart people's brains. And uh, we just record it for other people to listen to as well. Roger, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate your time. Yeah, you too, Mark. All the best.